we shot this earlier today, but I changed shirts to fool all of you into thinking it's a different day. And now I'm sitting on my garbage can, waiting for this water to boil. Who are we kidding? I don't think I'm fooling anyone. Hey everyone, I'm Claire. Welcome to my home kitchen. Today I have a very special recipe in honor of Valentine's Day, but frankly, it's perfect any day of the week, any month of the year. It's my forever brownies. It is a perfect, chewy, chocolatey, but not too chocolatey brownie. And special bonus, it has malted milk powder in it. My forever brownies, so named because it's the only recipe I'll ever need. As a brownie lover, I particularly prefer a chewy brownie, not a cakey brownie. I feel like a, a cakey brownie is just chocolate cake. I wanted it to be a dense, chewy brownie, but one that was fully baked and didn't just rely on under baking to give me that kind of like fudgy texture. Why did you name it forever? Right, so I called these my malted forever brownies because for me, this is now my go-to recipe. I'll, I won't need another one. I'll always go back to this one. It's my forever brownie. We're in a long-term, it's a long-term thing, me and this recipe. Special equipment, zero, none. You just need basic stuff you already have in your kitchen. So I have a saucepan over here, bowl, whisk, and an eight by eight pan. This recipe has like more ingredients than the average brownie, but it's again, all super basic stuff. So I have semi-sweet chocolate, all-purpose flour, vanilla extract, the malted milk powder, which is optional but recommended, large eggs, brown sugar, granulated sugar, unsalted butter, vegetable oil, milk chocolate, and cocoa powder. And also I'm missing salt. salt. What is malted milk powder? I've really been trying to, I know what like malted stuff is, but I have no wheat flour and malted barley extracts. So to malt something, malting is a process that's used in a lot of like making of spirits and beer where you basically sprout the grain. I don't really know what it is. The point is it makes things taste delicious. It pairs really well with chocolate. It's really good. I, I recommend it. Oh, we have to talk about the eight by eight pan. So I have a problem that it's ongoing whereby I keep losing my eight by eight metal pan. So this is the only eight by eight pan I could find last night, realizing I didn't have my metal pan. No idea where it is. It's the second time I've lost it. Um, so now I'm using glass. I recommend you use metal. I'm gonna bake in glass and it's gonna be fine. The first thing I wanna do is prepare my pan. Um, I have the oven already preheated to 350, which is gonna be our baking temp. So here's just a sheet of aluminum foil. The reason I like foil for brownies is because you can really press the foil into all of the corners of the pan and get it really flat. And then it makes it easy to lift out. And now you can use melted butter. This is just very room temp butter and it's a little warm in here. I just wanna coat the foil. So the first little pre-step to this recipe is to do something called bloom the cocoa. So basically I'm going to combine the cocoa and hot water, and this just brings out the flavor of the cocoa. Oh, the vet texted a photo of Felix, do you wanna see it? Mm, he looks so sad and uncomfortable. Doesn't he look sad? Poor kitty. All right, so now I have an electric kettle right here and I'm just bringing this to a boil. I'm gonna sit here and wait for this to boil. I got a lot of sticky buns over here. There's actually, there have been maybe fewer than a half dozen little typos that I found in the book. And there's a typo in this recipe. And it is involving this step. The recipe says a quarter cup of boiling water, but then it says, I think four ounces, which is a half cup. The correct measurement is a quarter cup or two ounces but readers have written in to say that they made it with a half cup and it still turns out great. So if you made that mistake, don't worry. So to this I'm adding six ounces of semi-sweet chocolate, then a quarter cup of oil. Oil contributes to a chewier texture in the final brownie. Six tablespoons of unsalted butter. This whole thing needs to get melted together. 
Chocolate is a very, very sensitive ingredient, particularly temperature sensitive. So that's just to say whenever we melt it, we want to do that very gently. And that's why I use a setup called a double boiler. Double boiler is kind of an old fashioned term. There is literally like a set of cookware called a double boiler that is a pot with another pot that's set into it and it fits together. But most people don't have that. So we're just using that same idea. I have a saucepan that's coming to a simmer over a fairly gentle heat. You don't want to rapidly boil it. It's filled with like an inch of water. And the idea is that I'm setting a bowl over it, a heat proof bowl. That's very important. And the water underneath is going to simmer. It's going to create steam and the steam will gently warm what's in the bowl. And I don't need to stir this on the heat until the chocolate is completely melted. I can actually take it off the heat and let the heat that's already in the bowl finish melting the chocolate. I just want to go most of the way. This is totally melted. The great thing about brownies is like we're already almost done. This is very quick once you have all the ingredients measured out. So it's a very um, like instant gratification recipe, except for the part where I say to chill it for at least an hour at the end, but we'll talk about that. Um, okay, the next step is to add the sugars to your chocolate mixture. I'm using a half cup each of light brown sugar and granulated sugar. And I'm doing that because the little addition of brown sugar also creates a bit of chewiness. And I like the sort of um, molasses-y flavor. It's subtle, but I think it goes well with the chocolate. This mixture, as I whisk it, it's, it looks, it's gonna look grainy. That's normal, don't worry. Just power through, and keep whisking. Once you have your sugar very well incorporated, I'm going to add my eggs. At this stage, I found that when you whisk the eggs in really well, they, it tends to produce that sort of shiny crackly top that to me is what I want. The neighbor, I think the neighbors are vacuuming. A loud vacuum. Really loud. Was I supposed to add the vanilla? Yeah, I was supposed to add the vanilla. Should I wait? Let's, I mean... <laughs> okay, excellent. All right. The upstairs vacuuming has stopped. Um, I forgot to add the vanilla. I'm going to do that along with the eggs. So one and a half teaspoons. It's important for a few reasons that you whisk the eggs in thoroughly. You not only want them to bring the batter together, and you should have something that looks super, super smooth. So go ahead and give it elbow grease. That's that, and now we're gonna add the dry ingredients. I have three quarters of a cup of all-purpose flour, um, a teaspoon of salt, kosher salt. If you're using Morton, use half the amount. Okay, now I'm adding the kind of secret ingredient, which is melted milk powder, two tablespoons. I'm whisking slowly to incorporate. And once I have all that flour worked in, now I wanna go ahead and whisk this, I think I say in the book, a full 45 seconds. So once I've added the flour, here's the chance to develop a little bit of a chewy texture by working that flour and trying to develop a little bit of gluten. You can see it makes this beautiful ribbon. I feel like I'm in one of those lint commercials. Last step, I'm gonna fold in milk chocolate. There's been such a trend toward ultra bitter dark chocolate. And I went along with it for a while only to kind of realize like, I don't love something that bitter. And I'm kind of into milk chocolate. I love how creamy it is, how easily it melts. This is why you don't want to make that chocolate mixture too hot at the beginning. You don't want to fold the milk chocolate into a hot batter because it'll melt. I feel like this pan is, says it's an eight by eight, but it's really not. The bottom of this pan is six inches across. Do you see that? In what world is this an eight by eight pan? I would like someone to explain to me. So in this pan, whereas typically I use a metal one, the batter is gonna sit a little taller. It's gonna be a thicker layer. It's gonna take probably longer than it typically would to bake. So typically with glass, I bake 25 degrees lower than the recipe states um, because I always test the recipe in metal, unless I say this is designed for a glass pan. Um, but in the case of these brownies, because the batter is in a thicker layer, I think I am gonna actually leave it on 350. And it's just the nature of brownies that these are not going to over bake the way that like a cake would. So you're still fine at 350 in glass. I feel like a little crazy right now. I think I need to drink some water. <laughs> I feel like I sound crazy, I'm talking really fast. 
The brownies are done. They went a little longer than expected, but I'll show you how you know when they're done. I see cracks along the surface. They have pulled away from the sides, and when I press in the center, what do I say in the book? It's like soft but firm or something like that. Hold on. Oh, okay, so the center is dry to the touch but still soft when pressed, which I think I nailed it. So dry to the touch but still you can see we got some squishiness in there. These are going to cool at room temp, and when I feel like the bottom of the pan is no longer hot, I can either stick the whole thing in the fridge or unmold them, cover them, and chill at least an hour. So I'm going to let these sit here and then pop them in the fridge. All right, so I'm looking on maybe one of my favorite pages in the whole book, which is a recipe matrix, which is an idea that I had that I included in the book, which basically locates every single recipe on, on like a grid with time on the X axis and difficulty on the Y. So the really easy quick recipes are at the bottom left and I'm looking for brownies and I seriously don't even see them. So there's miso buttermil buttermilk biscuits, which are very quick and easy. Poppy seed almond cake, quick and easy. The banana bread, quick and easy. Oh, they're right here, I see them, I see them. All right, there they are, Mal malted forever brownies. Now, this is, brings up a good point. So I had to look sort of toward the center of the matrix to find them and that's because even though the batter takes minutes and they only take 30 minutes to bake, you definitely don't want to cut warm brownies because they won't cut cleanly and they'll, you know, crumble and everything. The other thing is when you chill brownies, it gives the butter a chance to set, it gives the sugar a chance to kind of like crystallize and you end up with a super, super chewy texture and basically the brownies kind of cure. So I think that the, this recipe is not complete until the brownies have had a chance to chill. And I have a batch that I made last night that I'm gonna pull out because those have been chilling and they are ready to be eaten. Ay, ay, ay. Ah! Where do I put this? Uh, oh, the brownies. So, let's see, these are nice and cold. This recipe makes 16 nice sized brownies. So you can see the pockets of milk chocolate, which have hardened because they've been in the fridge. I'm gonna taste. I like an edge piece, but not a corner piece. I've not had these brownies in a long time. They really hold up. They are the right amount of intensity, not too sweet, the chocolate really shines, and most importantly, it has a wonderfully chewy texture. Obviously, this is a rich chocolate recipe, perfect for Valentine's Day. I hope you try it, but then again, there's like no wrong time to make or eat brownies at all. So thank you for watching another episode of Dessert Person. I love showing you recipes from the book and stay tuned and like and subscribe. Oh, oh, ferocious kitty, let go, let go. Oh, ah.